Hello learners, I hope that you are fine. In today's video, we have a short lecture about the main concepts related to defining performance and choosing a measurement approach. If you are new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. Organizational performance is a term that is used frequently and ubiquitously thus it's loosely defined in many cases. The concept of performance is inherently dependent on a variety of unique factors that are associated with the industry and the organization uh, in question. So we will have some level of variety. The lack of universal definition makes it difficult for professionals to settle on what they mean precisely by organizational performance and generally organizational performance can be uh, measured and assessed at different levels of hierarchy. It can be assessed for individuals, teams, groups or even the organization as a whole. In this context we can say that organizational performance can be simply defined as the actual outputs or results of an organization or one of the components of the organization as measured and gauged against its intended outputs, goals and objectives. So defining performance, as we said, is a little bit tricky. We can say that performance is about behaviors and actions. And when we say behaviors and actions, we mean what employees do. And also we can say that performance is about results and products. So this is going to be about the outcome of employee behavior in general. So as a overall understanding we can say that behaviors and actions together with the results and products are going to be yielding us a level of performance so performance can be defined through the behaviors and actions of the employees along with the results and products this is a very important quote that was said by Ginny Romiti uh, she is the chairman and um, the uh, former CEO of IBM and she says that you have to measure to understand if you don't measure if you don't gauge if you don't assess and evaluate you cannot understand what's going on within the organization you cannot understand if the performance is optimal or not there are two features of the behaviors and results that we label performance First of all, these behaviors can be evaluative, meaning that they can be considered as negative, neutral, or positive for the individual and organizational effectiveness. This actually indicates that the value of these behaviors and results can fluctuate and can uh, clearly vary depending on the extent to which they contribute towards the accomplishment of individual goals, team goals, unit goals, and overall organizational goals. Second, performance is considered to be multidimensional, which means that there are many different types of behaviors and results that have the capacity to advance and assist with the achievement of the organizational goals or to impede and hinder them on the other hand. So behaviors are not going to be always observable and measurable and results and products might be also used to infer and assume certain behaviors or as a representational proxy for behavioral measures. So why do certain individuals perform better than others within the same organization, having access to the same resources, having access to the same uh, tools and techniques, having access to the same technology and working in the same context. So the answer is um, we have a combination or a mixture of three factors and this is going to be allowing some people to perform better and at higher levels than 
other people. They are going to be better performers than the average performer. They are going to be better performers than their peers. So these are going to be abilities and other traits. We have knowledge and skills and we have the context. So the main determinants of performance are going to be coming from these three components. So abilities and other traits, knowledge and skills and the context uh, in general which is very important to understand. So if we want to actually uh, see things quite clearly, we can see that abilities and other traits are going to be about mainly the cognitive abilities, the personality, um, actually things like the physical characteristics and abilities, etc. depending on the type of the work, depending on actually the uh, environment of work depending on the industry etc when it comes to knowledge and skills we are going to be having things like declarative knowledge things like uh, principles of work uh, procedural knowledge etc and we have also the overall context which is going to be uh, constituted and built by the uh, human resource policies and procedures we are going to be having the culture of the organization etc all of these are going to be forming what we refer to as uh, a context and together these three elements will interact and will yield a certain level of performance and this performance is going to be different from one person to another from one professional to another within the organization this is something that you have to keep in mind so abilities and other traits, these are going to be the cognitive abilities, the personality, the stable motivational uh, dispositions, the physical characteristics and abilities, as we said. Um, and these are very important, but we need to keep in mind, again, that these are not going to be the only factors that will determine performance. As we said, we have also knowledge and skills. So we have the job related knowledge, we have skills, attitudes, and malleable uh, motivational states, which are also very important. When it comes to declarative knowledge, you have to understand that this is going to be constituted by two main components. We have uh, the information component and we have the understanding of task requirement component. So for information component, we have to understand that also information is going to be having many facets. So we need to have information about facts, about labels, about principles, about goals, etc. And along with the overall understanding of task requirements, this is going to be giving us what we refer to as the declarative knowledge. We have also the procedural knowledge and it's about knowing what to do and knowing how to do it. And this is going to be also needing to rely on certain skills of the worker or the professional. So the skills are going to be cognitive skills, physical skills, perceptual skills, motor skills, interpersonal skills. And sometimes you are going to be having some jobs where you need all of these skills at, at various levels, at, at different levels. But you will have other jobs where we are going to be needing certain um, of these or some of these skills, but not all of them. So for the context, as we said, it's going to be built up through the stacking of different components and elements. We are going to be having the human resources, policies and procedures. We are going to be having things like the managerial and peer leadership, organizational and national culture or local culture, issues about time and timing of performance, uh, resources and opportunities given to employees uh, for development, for growth, for advancement in their career, etc. In this context, it's important to introduce the concept of deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is a method of learning by doing, by actually practicing something and trying to repeat it many times in order to know how to do it correctly. So again, deliberate practice is a method of learning by doing. It is both mindful and highly structured form of learning relying on a process of repeated experimentation and this is going to be leading to mastery and eventually full automaticity of a specific skill. So deliberate practice is going to be involving certain elements. We need to have 
um, a very good understanding of all of these elements in order to um, be successful at deliberate practice. So these steps are going to be mainly starting with approaching performance with the goal of being ceaselessly better and constantly improving the performance. The second step is focusing on performance, what's happening and why this is actually happening. The third step is about requesting quality feedback from expert sources. The fourth step is about building mental models of the job, the current situation and the overall organization. And the fifth step, actually it's not really a step, it's about repeating these first four steps on an ongoing basis, continuously. Some important implications for addressing performance problems. Managers actually need information to precisely identify and pinpoint the sources of performance problems and issues so that they can fix them. And performance management systems must both measure performance and provide accurate information on sources and causes of performance problems. So, here it's important to understand that we are going to be having different performance dimensions and we are going to be having actually to understand the different types of multi-dimensional behaviors. First of all, you need to keep in mind that we have to focus on things like task performance, contextual performance, which is also called pro-social behaviors or organizational citizenship, um, things also like counterproductive performance need to be assessed and understood quite clearly and also adaptive performance. So task performance is going to be generally defined as the activities that will transform raw materials that will help with transformation process and here we will have of course different sub elements like replenishing like distributing supporting etc and then we have the contextual performance which is defined as behaviors that will generally contribute to the effectiveness of the organization and they will provide a good environment a good overall context in which tasks are going to be done correctly and then we can say that task performance is actually happening. The main differences actually between task and contextual um, performance, they must be of course first of all considered separately because they do not necessarily occur in tandem. So task performance generally varies across jobs, it is likely to be role prescribed and it is influenced by abilities and skills. On the other hand, contextual performance is fairly similar across different jobs and it's not likely to be role prescribed and it is influenced by personality. So you see why we consider them as two separate elements that are not happening in tandem. So why actually include task and contextual performance dimensions in performance management systems? There are, of course, numerous and several persistent motives and reasons why both task and contextual performance dimensions should be included in a performance management system. First of all, we can say that we have this global competition that is rising the levels of effort required of the organization and consequently of the efforts of the employees. That's why it might have been sufficient and adequate in the past to have a workforce that was competent in task performance, today's globalized fast-moving era and accompanying competitive uh, forces might make it actually uh, quite imperative and vital and crucial that the workforce also engage in positive contextual performance. It is actually challenging to compete if an organization employs professionals that do not engage in contextual behaviors. The second important element here to consider, and of course this is somewhat related to the issue of global competition, is the need to offer outstanding customer service and support. And you know that you can get services now worldwide, not necessarily you are buying and shopping for services in your own country, depending where you live, depending on the level of performance 
of the organizations in your country or in your region, in certain areas or in certain uh, fields or industries, you are able to choose from a variety of services from different countries worldwide. So this is why actually customer service and support are very, very important because you are competing from people from all over the world. Moreover, contextual performance behaviors can make a profound impact on customer satisfaction. And although some teams might not be permanent because they are created to complete specific short-term tasks, which is the case, for example, of project teams in general, uh, the reality of today's professional world is that teams are usually here to stay. We don't want to have high levels of turnover, as you know, and interpersonal cooperation is key to determine the fact that this team is going to be effective and this team is going to be successful and that we are going to be having very, um, let's say, in good teamwork uh, outcomes. These are all things that are very important. Also, you have to keep in mind that including both task and contextual performance in the performance management system is going to be providing an additional benefit, which is actually the fact that employees are going to be uh, rated and they are going to be more satisfied with the system and they will also believe that the system is more just and fair if contextual performance is measured in addition to task performance. In addition, when supervisors actually evaluate performance, it is demanding and hard for them to ignore the contextual performance dimension. And therefore, because contextual performance has an impact on ratings of overall performance, even when only task performance is measured, it makes sense to include contextual performance more explicitly to facilitate the task of the supervisor. There are also advantages when it comes to considering and including cultural differences in the organization. And this is why we need to rely on contextual performance in addition to task performance. The main approaches to measuring performance, we have the behavior approach and we have the results approach. So the behavior approach is about focusing on how employees behave and consequently do their jobs. The results approach actually emphasizes what employees produce. So we will focus on the production of the employees in general. Behavior approach is going to be appropriate if link between behaviors and results is not obvious. We don't have a clear connection or binding between the behaviors and the results. Also, it's appropriate when outcomes happen in distant future. So we don't have lots of visibility and we are enabled to forecast many elements. We are going to be relying on behavior approach. And it's also appropriate to use behavior approach if poor results are due to causes beyond the performer's control, so like having bad or outdated technology, etc. Using behavior approach is not appropriate if the aforementioned conditions are not present. The results approach, on the other hand, will have different advantages because it requires less time, it will cost less, so we have lower costs, and the data seems to be more objective. And it's going to be mostly appropriate when workers are skilled in the necessary behaviors, and behaviors and results obviously are related, and when we have also consistent improvement in results over time, we have a clear trend of improvement of the results over time, so this is also important. And finally, when there are many ways to do the job right. So we have different alternatives of doing the tasks and doing the job, and this is going to be giving us actually uh, more reasons to use results approach. This is it for today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. I hope that this lecture is informative for you and see you soon. Subscribe to the channel, like this video and share it. 
and comment about what you want to uh, have as videos in the future. Thank you.